testosterone and estrogen, of course, are involved in reproductive biology, but they are both vitally important, provided they are in the proper ratios, for motivational biology. Oh, you know, starting at 30, your testosterone drops and you're going to feel miserable and you're going to recover more slowly. In this eye-opening video, Andrew Huberman sheds light on the misconceptions surrounding testosterone and its relationship with aggression. Huberman explains that stress, rather than testosterone, is a key factor in determining our responses and behaviors. People that inject phthalates during puberty and in the post-puberty years, it's conceivable that those phthalates could inhibit the activating effects of androgens, not just what we call the organizing effects of androgens early in life. Okay, why is this interesting and important? Well, sperm counts are definitely going down. Are they going down so much so that people are incapable of reproducing? Probably not because, you know, as they told us in school, it just takes one and indeed it just takes one sperm, but it is a probability, it's a numbers game. According to Huberman, stress is a crucial element in our lives. Insufficient stress can actually lead to boredom and decreased functionality, while excessive stress impairs our ability to function effectively. I know, so. Conversely, testosterone doesn't directly cause aggression, but it can actually amplify aggressive responses and lower the threshold for such a behavior. Uh, and they communicate with an area of the brain that's vitally important called the hypothalamus. It sits right above the roof of your mouth and it harbors a bunch of structures that are responsible for hormones like testosterone and estrogen, for um, cortisol release um, in other locations in the body. Basically controls when you're going to be alert, when you're going to be asleep, your hormones, your immune system function, and your appetite and your mood. Huberman also discusses the role of estrogen, which contributes to maternal aggression and offers various cognitive and neurological benefits. Additionally, he touches upon the impact of endocrine disruptors on fertility and hormone levels, although the exact mechanisms and contributions of social factors are still being studied. Now, one thing about hot baths and hot sauna is they will nuke your sperm. It's not nuke, a nuke is a, you know, is a slang. <laughs> they will reduce viable sperm counts. So for males that are trying to re reproduce, you know, trying to create children, you want to be careful about hot baths and hot sauna too often. Some people will bring a cold pack in and put it in their groin. You can't do that in a bath. <laughs> but it's, it, I mean, sperm are maintained outside the body. The testicles are maintained outside the body. Throughout the video, Huberman emphasizes the importance of considering context when interpreting behavior. Genetic factors, brain structure, and evolutionary influences all play a significant role in shaping our actions. So you want to be uncomfortable in the cold. You want to be uncomfortable in the heat. This is why I'm not a big fan of infrared saunas, because they only go up to about 160, 170 degrees. Infrared light and far red light of all kinds has been shown to be beneficial for wound healing, acne, skin, eyes. There are even guys now putting on their testicles because it can increase testosterone and sperm production. Yeah, hormone release. Hormone release. But in terms of the sauna, you want that strong heat stimulus. Yeah, and so, that's when you get, crawl up to the 200 mark right. and so on. Whenever I'm in New York, and there's also one in San Francisco, although the one in San Francisco is, is clothing optional, just to warn people, there's an, a place called Archimedes Banya. Is there any scientific evidence that being naked is beneficial in the sauna? Well, in certain contexts, it leads to um, childbirth. Okay, well, I'll have to read <laughs> up on that. I read no, that somewhere. But um, I, I suppose it's not required, right, okay. uh, for childbirth. He encourages us to embrace knowledge as a powerful tool for personal growth, urging us to explore different perspectives. Furthermore, the conversation explores the complexities of agency and the history of removing volition from various domains of blame. There's a slow system associated with achieving wins, even small wins, and that slow system is in the form of hormonal control that then translates to gene control. So two hormones in particular, testosterone and estrogen, um, which are present in both men and women, males and females, of course, um, but to varying degrees, um, are both secreted when the dopamine system is activated. This has to do with the relationship between dopaminergic neurons and the pituitary gland, which releases gonadotropins and luteinizing hormones, which then stimulate the testes and the ovaries, et cetera, to release the so-called sex steroid hormones. The sex steroid hormones, testosterone and estrogen, of course, are involved in reproductive biology, but they are both vitally important, provided they are in the proper ratios, for motivational biology and for the following reason. The steroid hormones are, are so-called lipophilic and they can cross from the outside of a cell through the cell membrane 
to actually into the nucleus of a cell and control gene expression. So when we achieve wins repeatedly, and again, this doesn't matter if you're male or female, you achieve wins repeatedly. Testosterone is the molecule that eventually accesses not just cells to control their immediate physiology, but goes into the nucleus of those cells and controls their gene expression. This video serves as a reminder that our behaviors are so multifaceted and influenced by a variety of factors. It encourages us to question prevailing myths, broaden our understanding, and embrace the power of knowledge to promote personal and societal growth. Very surprising is I get a lot of questions about sexual health from the young male audience, mm. um, which tells me that, well, here's what I think it reflects. I think that women, because of their menstrual cycles early on start to talk to one another about changes in physiology and psychology as a function of this 28 day cycle that they all experience sooner or later males there's less of a conversation and it usually arrives in code people will say hey what should i take to increase my testosterone no. and i'll say well maybe nothing you know uh what are you specifically concerned about and then over time if you pull on those threads a little bit you, you know you get your answer the problem is most people are going to bed late, they're waking up at four or five hours later, then they're scrolling on their phone because it's a very kind of passive sensory input. They're trying to get themselves back to sleep, it doesn't work. And then throughout the day, they're working at about 75% capacity. So I would encourage those people to just start going to bed earlier. Um, I, I didn't finish up with melatonin earlier. I'm not a fan, not a fan of melatonin supplementation. Dosages are much too high. It's a hormone that interacts with the other hormone systems of the brain and body. Mostly the dosages are much too high. What you take in terms of one milligram melatonin, very small dosage, something like a hundred times what you naturally secrete. I get really concerned about this, especially in kids because melatonin is actually the hormone that suppresses the onset of puberty. Um, I don't have any direct data in myself, but I'm not interested in taking a hormone uh, exogenous hormone that suppresses the uh, sex steroid hormones, which are testosterone and estrogen, powerful hormones in men and women um, for all sorts of things. And I know that a lot of people just think, oh, testosterone, men, estrogen, women, but that's not the way it works. They're present in both. And actually having sufficient levels of estrogen for, for men, provided it's not too high, is important for brain longevity and health. It's actually really important for libido. A lot of people that um, get on uh, hormone replacement. Men that get on hormone replacement will take things like an astrazole and they'll start crushing their um, estrogen and they run into serious sexual side effects. So you want these things working naturally, um, hormone therapy or not, and melatonin just, it, it causes all sorts of problems. So I, I know that the melatonin supplement uh, manufacturers probably don't like that I say this, but melatonin is, should, I don't think should be just taken the way that people take it like M&Ms. Um, maybe occasionally for jet lag, but don't rely on this powerful hormone. It, it disrupts a number of other systems. So, and then you start to think about, okay, what happens in the cascade or the arc of, of sexual arousal and, and orgasm? What happens is that initially there's a, a, it's parasympathetically dominant, meaning if somebody is too uh, stressed, they actually can't engage in sexual behavior. The arousal response doesn't occur. Erection is blunted, but the actual orgasm response and ejaculation is strongly associated with the so-called sympathetic nervous system, which has nothing to do with sympathy, it has everything to do with, it's a kind of a stress response. And then it reverses to a parasympathetic response. And then a hormone called prolactin increases dramatically after ejaculation in males. What does that do? That blunts dopamine release and testosterone for a very long period of time, which makes sense if pair bonding and sort of, you know, in our species anywhere, there's this idea that then other molecules would be exchanged with partners, pair bonding, potential for raising mates, etc. Without getting into a huge discussion about that, the point is this, masturbation and pornography are potently tapping into the dopamine system and can undermine the very processes of which I consider healthy processes of finding a mate, you know, dating, communication, eventually, if it's appropriate, sexual interaction, well, it et cetera. Like